Hello fellow lovers of science. This is a video made for the University of Michigan's MCDB 427 Molecular Biology class. My name is Lee Ann Olney. For this video, I will have the privilege of teaching you about figures 11.9 and 11.10 in Robert F. Weaver's Molecular Biology 5th edition textbook. These two figures go into the nitty gritty of where eukaryotic transcription factor D of polymerase 2 binds to DNA. So without further ado, let's get started. Before we head on over to the figures, there are a couple underlying concepts that we all should know. The first concept is that DNA has major and minor groups. Provided, provided by the vases, there are protein donors and acceptors all along the DNA, shown here in red and blue. There are three hydrogen bonding sites on the major group, shown here, while only two to three on the minor group. As you can see here, it is hard to tell the difference between the C and the T base on the minor group because they only have an oxygen as a hydrogen acceptor. The fact that the major group has more hydrogen bonding sites and is unique for all four of the bases means that this side has more information, which helps the protein bind to their specific place on DNA. In this way, proteins are more likely to bind to the major group. Keep this in mind when we dive into the experiment later. The second concept is that the proteins in question today, those are the TAFs. What are the TAFs? Well, the abbreviation is spelled out for you here, TBP associated factors. TBP stands for Tata binding protein. The Tata binding protein is shown here in blue. Both the TAFs and the Tata binding protein are part of the TF2D complex the transcription factor D of polymerase II complex. The TAFs are numbered 1 through 13 on this figure and are the proteins that basically interact with the promoter element, such as the initiator, the DPE downstream promoter element, or other pro promoter proximal elements in conjunction with the Tata binding protein. TAFs also have other functions, but the one thing we will focus on today is that it interacts with the promoter elements. One thing, though, that should be noted about the TBP here is that Tata, the, the element that it binds to, is on the minor groove, which will be important to remember when we get to the experiment later. So the researchers question they wanted to answer in the upcoming experiments is which of these taps bind to the DNA, and specifically where? Are they on the initiator and DPE sites or somewhere else? So, to answer the first question, they use the method of photo cross-linking via BRDU exposed to UV light, DNA, and SDS page. For the second question they are answering today, they use DNA footprinting, but we'll get into that later. First, let's focus on this concept of photo cross-linking using BRDU. So, what exactly is BRDU? BRDU is an abbreviation for bromodeoxyuridine spell out for you here. Try to say this word five times fast. Hard, right? So we'll say BRDU for short. This molecule I've illustrated for you here is very similar in structure to thymine found in DNA. Take a second and pause this video to think about the difference in these two molecules and what will the protocrosslinking be doing to the protein when exposed to light. Welcome back. The difference between these bases is that the bromine group on BRDU is replacing the methyl group on thymine. So this must be the part doing the photo cross-linking to the protein when exposed to light. Since they are so similar, they constructed a radioactive DNA promoter sequence, which has a Tata box, the initiator site, and a DPE site. And this is model modeled off of the protein HSP70 and its promoter. So this is all radioactive. The whole thing is radioactive. Every single base in this sequence is radioactive. And they replaced every single T in this sequence with BRDU. So they placed all the thymines in this sequence with BRDU. So all along this is BRDUs. In, 
this way, whenever a protein binds somewhere along this DNA sequence, they will have a high probability to be a BRDU base that can photocross-link it to it when it is exposed to light. So they added this radioactive DNA that I just told you about into the test tube. My pen is dying. <laughs> so that is in the test tube. They also added their desired proteins. So they either added to the test tube the whole T of 2D complex, which includes all 13 tabs and TBP. Or they added to another test tube, TAF1, TAF2, and TBP, or they added TBP on its own, which we know binds to Tata. So they added all this into the test tube, then they let their proteins bind to the specific areas, if they do, to the DNA. And then the next step is they shined it with light. They expose it to UV, and that's the part of the light that we care about. So what is happening in the test tube? Well, the protein in question is binding to DNA, if it is, and wherever it does, die, does bind, there is a BRDU close by. And when exposed to light, it photocross links with the protein. What we'll get is a protein DNA complex that is covalently bonded together. And then they add DNAs. What you get out of this test tube right here is a bunch of proteins bonded to little slivers of DNA. The DNA gets rid of all the unprotected DNA. So what you will see on your auto radiogram after STS page is just the radioactive DNA that they that has been protected from the protein or by the protein. But there is a catch to this. You know how we were talking about major and minor grooves earlier? Well, the catch here is that BRDU can only cross-link to proteins associated with the major groove. In this test tube here TBP binds to Tata, but Tata is on the minor groove. So we shouldn't see any radioactive bands in the DNA from the DNA on our autoradiogram after SDS page because TBP is not being photocross link and therefore not protecting the DNA from the DNAs. So let's get to the results. Here's the gel to answer the question of which of my tabs are binding to our S our promoter DNA. The first lane here is a test tube in which they added only to transcription factor 2D complex. So all 13 TAFs and TBP are in this test tube. The second lane is in control to make sure that there are no bands when added when we add no protein. So we shouldn't see any bands here because there's no protein in the test tube to bind to DNA and protect it from the DNA so we treated it with. This is the control. The third lane is a little bit more specific because the researchers added only TAF1, TAF2, and TBP. I have a feeling they did this lane after re receiving the results for lane 1 and 2 due to the known molecular weights of all the different STF2D subunits. TAF1 is known to have a molecular, molecular weight around 250 kilodaltons, so that is right about here on the gel, which they labeled for you right here. TAF2 is known to have a molecular weight of around 150 kilodaltons, and that is labeled for you right here. Uh, and the fourth lane here is with the addition of just the Tata binding protein. I have previously told you that it binds to the minor groove. But our, DD, our BRDU method doesn't allow for photocross-linking on the minor groove only on the major, major groove. So we shouldn't see any bands in this lane, which is good because we don't. So what conclusions can we make from this gel? Well, I think the most important conclusion we can make from this gel is that TAF1 and TAF2 are the subunits of TF2D that bind to the major groove of the promoter sequence. Some other conclusions that you can make is that TF2D complex does bind to DNA via at least two subunits. 
and we see that here. We also can say that TBP does not bind to the major groove. We cannot make the conclusion that TBP binds to the minor groove from this gel. The only thing that we know is that it does not bind to the major groove. Take a moment and pause this video to try to think of one or two other conclusions you can make from this gel. So now that we know that it is TAF1 and TAF2 that binds to the DNA, promoter region, where are they binding? Is it the initiator and DPE sites or somewhere else? And that's what they did for the next figure, 11.10. They answered this question using the DNA footprinting method. If you're unfamiliar with this type of method, feel free to pause the video and review all the ins and outs of footprinting. If you left us, welcome back. Footprinting is basically allowing the protein to bind to radiolabeled DNA, cleaving the DNA using DNase or some other cleaving agent, and then this will give a random like ladder-like distribution when run on, on a gel. These bands are the places DNA DNase cut under the conditions used. It will leave out the bands where the protein shielded the DNA from being cleaved. So they use the same promoter again, which I will reiterate is the Tata box, the initiator site, and DPE. So for the first lane is the DNA footprinting method without the addition of any proteins that would bind to the DNA. This lane can be used as a control to compare the other lanes with. The second lane is with the addition of just the Tata binding protein. We already know that this binds to the Tata box. So we see a nice footprint right here where I drew that line, as well as a hypersensitive site at the top here. We know that this is a hypersensitive site because without any protein, there is a smaller, brand, smaller band right here. It is actually known that TBP bends the DNA about 80 degrees. And DNase is a large enough enzyme that it can be affected by local DNA structure. The DNase is affected by this 80 degree change, so the result is a hypersensitive site. For the next lane, the researchers included TAF1, TAF2, and TBP and assessed the footprint. With this lane, the Tata box is covered, as you can see, as expected, but the initiator and the DPE sites are also covered. This last lane here is a Maxim Gilbert sequencing lane. It is a radio labeled DNA ladder that is chemically treated to generate breaks in the DNA at G and A bases. It is used to help you know exactly where on the DNA sequence you are looking. So what conclusions can we make from this gel? Well, I think the most important conclusion that answers our question of where TAF1 and TAF2 bind to the promoter region is that they bind to the initiator and DPE sites. We cannot conclude it is, is that one or the other binds, or that they both bind to the gel. It could just be TAF1, TAF2, or both. If you think about the previous gel, however, figure 11.9, we know it's both that's binding, but we still don't know which one bind to what element solely from this specific gel. They unfortunately did not include a lane with just TAF1 and TAF2 on their own to investigate this further. Other conclusions you can make from this is that TBP only binds to the Tata box. And we can see that from lane two. Also, TBP creates a hypersensitive site, as I showed earlier with these two bands right here. And how there's no dark band in the lane with just DNA right here. Can you think of a few more conclu conclusions? Feel free to pause this video and brainstorm. So what did we learn today? We learned that you can photocrosslink a DNA binding protein using bromodeoxy, uridine, and UV light, but only if that protein binds to the major group. We also learned that TF2D subunits, TAF1, TAF2, bind to the DNA from figure 11.9, and they cover the initiator and DPE promoter sites. But what is left to find out is which TAF goes with what promoter element. When I first was introduced to this concept and these figures, I was astonished at the amount of subunits TF2D had. And to think, they probably all have different functions. Science is cool. 
Thanks for listening to this video about figures 11.9 and 11.10 of Robert F. Weaver's Molecular Biology 5th Edition textbook. Happy science!